Welcome to Lincoln House. I'm Armando Carbonell. I chair the Department of Planning and Urban Forum here, where we work on issues related to today's topic, climate change in cities, among others. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, a good friend of the Lincoln Institute, and currently a fellow here, as well as a low fellow at Harvard, uh, Gil Kelly. Uh, for those that are you, you are very close friends of Gil, <laughs> I can see, looking around, but for those who don't uh, know him, uh, up until this year, Gil was the planning director of Fort Gargan, uh, jogging for uh, almost 10 years. Uh, for 10 years before that, he was the planning director of Berkeley, California. So he's a seasoned planning director, and in his Portland job, he participated in a program that we do at the Lincoln Institute with the Harvard Graduate School of Design and the American Planning Association for big city planning directors. And I'd say he had a, an instrumental role in uh, bringing to that group this very topic of uh, planning for climate change and the role of cities in both uh, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions and uh, adapting to unavoidable climate change that uh, affects cities. So uh, Gil is going to talk about work he's been doing this year while in Cambridge that relates uh, to the form of cities to climate change, and in particular talk about what we can learn from the city of Portland, Oregon, and how that might uh, be uh, extended to look uh, at other cities in the United States and around the world. So Gil, if you're ready. Sure. Thanks for coming and uh, listening today. Uh, some of this that I'll say may be familiar to some of you. Um, uh, this is an audience that uh, appears from the looks of it and from the people I know here to be fairly well schooled in some of the background on climate change issues. Um, so I'll try to dispense with some of the background rather quickly and get to the meat of the matter. But I, I do want to set it up uh, in a way. So uh, I, I think the first part of what I'd like to say is to thank Armando, uh, Greg, and the uh, Lincoln Institute for um, really expressing an, a, a deep interest in this topic over the last several years. Um, it wasn't really a mainstream popular topic. Uh, just a few years ago, and Lincoln has really dedicated itself, among, among other investigations, to really looking at this phenomenon of the um, application of ideas about uh, city shaping or urban form uh, to uh, mitigating uh, climate change. Uh, and that's really, my focus is about mitigating climate change here, not so much about adapting to climate change, which is the other half of the equation, of course, and also concerns uh, the shape and form uh, of cities. Um, but I'm going to focus on the mitigation piece. Um, and I think that's because uh, it's really putting the uh, horse before the cart to think about mitigating the levels first. Um, everything we do to knock down the potential levels of increases uh, means we have a lot less extreme and expensive work to do on the adaptation side. There will still be lots of that. but. Um, Everything I read in here is that uh, it really becomes exponentially more difficult if we uh, wait any longer uh, and don't act aggressively uh, to really mitigate the possible worst effects of uh, climate change and the uh, increases uh, in greenhouse gas emissions that bring those. Um, uh, I, the other point I want to make at the beginning here is that uh, while many institutions have been kind of racing to embrace technological advances to um, reduce uh, climate change, um, electric cars, various kinds of energy technologies and so forth. Um, even nuclear power and so-called clean coal are coming up as uh, components of that. And I think that's, those are fine to in investigate, but I'm particularly heartened by Lincoln's uh, focus on the possibility that there may be some good old-fashioned ways in which we shape our cities that may actually pay as much or potentially even greater benefits than some of those probably both technology uh, and uh, city planning, city development will be absolutely necessary to meet the climate change challenge. I just want to give you one example of that to sort of keep in your mind and that is um, uh, let's just take one standard work trip um, by car. And most Americans travel some distance now from the outskirts of the city to an employment center either 
elsewhere in the suburbs or in the middle of the city. And that's generally done by a gasoline-powered engine, often driving um, solely, sometimes car sharing. Um, probably the best we can do in 25 or 30 years is to get the average efficiency of that vehicle to knock off maybe 35 percent when you only take a gross average of the carbon emissions. That's because the, the U.S. fleet only turns over about once every 17 years and there's only so much we can do with technology that we now see. They could accelerate, but I, got, I guess I want you to compare in your mind the notion uh, that we like to use in Portland of the trip not taken. That is to say, if you can walk or take transit to work, that's 100% efficiency, not 35% uh, efficiency. And so that's the kind of idea, I think, that we're talking about when we talk about the power of urban form uh, in this arena. Um, how much of the climate change reduction that is needed by 2050, which is sort of the magic year, um, after which we become, all become toast, and many are saying if we don't start aggressively by 2015 on that road to 2050, uh, we may not be able to reach the 2050 targets. Um, uh, how much could come from manipulating the urban form in, in beneficial ways is really a subject of debate. There's a major study out now, the Transportation Research uh, Board, which basically says somewhere between 3 and 10 percent along those lines. Not, uh, not the overwhelming number I was hoping for. I think there are reasons to question that number and see if that could be lifted. But I think even taking a 10 percent figure um, uh, is not overly optimistic and one that is still going to be necessary for contribution. And I'll talk in a little bit about why I think that range could be questioned and could be a bit low, but mostly I'm going to focus on the question of, so how would we get there, whether it's 10 percent or 20 percent of the equation, uh, how would we get there and how might some of the lessons from, from Portland um, be applicable in this discussion and potentially transferable to other cities. Um, I want to say two things before getting into the heart of the analysis, and that is that um, Portland has had a success story, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but it is limited. Um, it is not currently on a trajectory to meet those 2050 numbers. Um, it, uh, there's a lot of policy language in place that is a hopeful path to get us there, uh, but when you see the results here in a minute, you'll see there's a lot more that has to be done, both in terms of the strategies we've already employed, beefing those up, intensifying those, and availing ourselves of lots of other um, means by which to get there. Um, so so it's, a, it's a good story, but it's not the whole story. It's not sufficient to just say, just be like Portland, everything will be fine. Um, uh, and I think it may provide those some clues uh, to how we might succeed uh, uh, in a few other areas. The other thing I'd like to mention is that um, this uh, talk today is part of a work in progress, so I don't have definitive answers for you, and I'll be continuing this work uh, with Armando and others over the next couple months to kind of uh, fill in some of the gaps here and uh, do a phase two, which I'll talk about as we get a little bit further into the presentation. But along those lines, your comments and questions today will be extremely helpful to me in, in completing this investigation. So um, have at it when we get to that point. I think we'll probably hold questions <coughs> until the end. I think it'll probably be most efficient. Um, so I wanted to just uh, start with some key assumptions that I made uh, for my investigation. Again, some of these are very general, but I think they are extremely important. And when you get outside of rooms like this and out into the general public discussion, it's rather amazing how shaky <laughs> the knowledge is about the climate change phenomenon. So uh, first of all, um, stating the obvious that um, a key underpinning here for me is that the climate change phenomenon is real, um, <coughs> that it, this is of a geologic proportions, this isn't simply a cycle in modern history, that since industrialization the curve has been off the charts, um, uh, which says uh, a couple of things. One is that uh, those levels pose significant risk, not only to our natural environment, but to society itself. And um, at, at the higher levels of the projections, um, you really run into scenarios of major dislocations of world populations, particularly coastal communities, but also um, 
uh, growing of arid zones uh, and depopulation of large inland po populations that will then become too dry. Wildfires, those are particularly of concern in the northwest uh, because of the seasonal changes in rainfall and um, wetter winters and drier summers and so forth. Um, you know, really leading at the extreme ends to probably civil unrest and war, famine, uh, and so forth and so on. I don't think those are uh, just um, Al Gore trying to get your attention. Those, those could be real phenomena as we get in the out years if we don't act. Um, the, other, the other piece, of course, um, uh, is that our own activities uh, are really the proximate cause. There's no real other explanation for the rapid and sustained increase over the last uh, 70 or 80 years in uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so it maybe can't be absolutely proved, but it uh, certainly um, appears from the evidence that there's no other credible explanation other than uh, industrial activity um, causing those levels of carbon emission. Excuse me. Um, here is both uh, an assumption and an, an assertion, which I'll try to prove out in the presentation, that the form of human settlement is a significant contributing factor um, to climate change, and, and it needs to be part of the solution. I don't think we're going to be able to get out of it just by making cleaner cars and have everything just be okay. Um, uh, local uh, initiative um, and sustained local action are essential to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This is important uh, to understand, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about Portland, which is largely the story of local initiatives. Um, and it's important because we all have been waiting a long time already um, for international accords, for federal action, for state action. There are some states like California that are being fairly aggressive. But in most cases, cases and in many important ways, it really gets down to the local level or the metropolitan level to resolve these issues. Uh, we're hoping more tools become available through uh, federal action. Uh, we hope better standards are set through international accords. And we certainly um, uh, would hope that eventually the price of carbon begins to, uh, the cost of carbon begins to get priced in uh, in some mechanism that uh, changes um, uh, investment behavior but it still ends up being at the local level where you have to figure out how to do these things, and particularly when that comes to um, uh, issues of urban form. Um, and the final assumption I want to just uh, make clear is that I uh, think, from my view, that local governments, including uh, Portland's, although it's better equipped than some, are generally not equipped to address the climate change challenge. And that goes to two aspects. It goes to um, uh, a really a knowledge about what works and what doesn't work. What's our menu? <laughs> what do we do? What do we do first? What's the, what, what could be the most uh, efficacious set of strategies for our place? Very little knowledge about that out there. And secondly, is really a governance or organizational question. These issues are going to need to play across several sectors, not just the government sector, but corporate, uh, institutional, uh, citizen, uh, nonprofit sectors to have any hope of surviving, and they have to play across city jurisdictional boundaries to make any real difference. So it's both a knowledge of what works and what doesn't work, and also this organizing, set of organizing notions that I think um, we're not there yet. We're a long way uh, from getting there. And that's going to be, I believe, just as important as any urban design or technical solution uh, that we talk about. Everybody following me so far? Okay, yeah, okay. Awake? <laughs> okay. Uh, the, just a couple of images. You don't need to see these probably, but I, I tried not to pick the polar bear and all that stuff. But just to say, you know, here's some real evidence in our backyard in the U.S. of uh, actual um, uh, climate uh, change patterns. These are uh, plant uh, communities, uh, plant hardiness maps produced by the National Arbor Day Foundation. You know, pretty innocuous group concerned about the environment, but not overstating its case, just showing you what a trend has been over a 16-year period, and that's actually pretty, pretty dramatic. Um, some naysayers would argue that could be cyclical. Um, I don't think when you look at the larger body of evidence it is, but it shows you sort of how real that might be. Uh, I talked a moment ago about mitigation versus adaptation. Here's kind of how it looks graphically. Uh, we want to be down at the two degrees Celsius mark if we can, and that will take very, very aggressive action worldwide, but really probably beginning in the developed countries uh, like ours. Uh, 
Um, because if we don't act aggressively, and at the beginning of this curve, uh, the further you get out, the harder it gets. And when you get to the four degree, which, which many scientists are now upping to above four degrees, even MIT came out with a study in the last year that looked at the probability range of being somewhere between uh, three and seven, and probably the heart of that is four to, four to six degree Celsius rise in average annual temperatures. That's, ex that's very extreme. Um, and and the, the, thing about the, un the unfortunate thing about greenhouse gases is that they're cumulative. They don't just go away tomorrow. <laughs> they hang there. So this is a long, long pr process. Um, and so we need to start acting quickly. This translates, of course, to the 2050 uh, year. Uh, many, mari many jurisdictions who are looking at this are pegging an interim year of, um, in that 40-year zone of halfway at 20 years of 2030, including Portland's own climate action plan, as having some interim benchmarks and some strategies that are targeted at that interim uh, a time frame. Um, but it, it, it means that uh, somehow we're getting worldwide um, parts per million of greenhouse gases down to about the 350 range to be stable, which represents almost pre-industrial levels. So we're going to have to be clever about keeping up production and doing it in a clean way. Um, and uh, in some ways that resembles about the U.S. in 1950 or 55, where we had some automobiles but very little sprawl and relatively few automobiles and so forth that we have today. Um, we did have coal plants. Um, to understand it a bit more closely and start to zoom in down to the metro or city level, uh, here's what EPA uh, says are sort of the, the um, sources of greenhouse gases, and I actually prefer this accounting over the business sector accounting, which, you know, you chose industry, commercial, residential. I guess that's helpful to some degree, but um, and some parts of society are organized that way, but this is more of a system look. Um, so when you look at um, teasing apart transportation, for example, that's often lumped together, you find that local tra uh, passenger transport, which seems like a, a relatively good if not an easy target, uh, is the biggest or, or, or tied with the biggest share. The provision of goods, which is really the manufacture and, um, uh, and processing and, and distribution of, uh, of manufactured goods um, uh, is next. Buildings, which are often the, the favorite subject. Well, let's just, let's just make our buildings better. Well, all of that might get us 25%. Um, and I would argue that a part of that is involved in the urban form uh, discussion, and I'll come back to that later. Part of it is simply energy technologies in buildings, but I want to talk about the urban form part that maybe <coughs> may, may play some part of that 25%. Um, provision of food takes an amazing amount of energy and throws off, uh, and this is everything from agriculture uh, and methane to uh, trucking food into uh, city centers and distribution centers. Um, other passenger transport, which is the reason for pulling this out of local, is really air travel <coughs> and uh, rail travel and long distance um, uh, travel. Uh, that's, that's a hard target for <coughs> local jurisdictions and um, uh, uh, metropolitan areas. But it's a great target for the federal government to start looking at. Um, appliances and devices, we we'll pulled those out of the, the building, uh, heating and lighting, um, because there's a whole different stream of manufacture and purchasing for those. Uh, and they could easily be subject to a different set of standards, and they increasingly are for energy efficiency, is about 8%. And infrastructure really is only about 1% of the, of the problem. Is that view helpful to any of you? <laughs> You've seen it all before. Um, so uh, uh, people around the country for the last few years, mostly at the state and, and some local level, have been busy responding to this science and setting policy targets, even if they don't know quite yet how to get there. And that's certainly the case in the western United States, where um, I think six states came together, um, and the Brit uh, province of British Columbia as well, sort of saying, you know, we ought to have this Western States Climate Initiative and it ought to um, target those 2050 reductions of about 80% below 1990 levels. So that's become the standard that is now the Obama administration's talking point as well. Um, 
And so you kind of see graphically here that we're nowhere near staying even on the 1990 levels as a, as a U.S. trend if we don't take radical action just continues to, to grow and grow. And the 80% below is a pretty deep number. Um, it's a big, it's a steep uh, challenge. Um, here's what I want to give you a preview of in terms of Portland. Um, this is a pretty dramatic counter trend. Um, this is for Portland, the city of, and Multnomah County, which is the most urban county surrounding Portland. It's not the only urbanized county, so this number may not be exactly replicable for the rest of the metro area, but uh, Multnomah County has a lot of land that was annexed uh, over the last um, 20 years and has seen a lot of housing growth. And in fact, 55% uh, I believe of all new housing starts in the Portland metro area between 2004 and 2007 or 8, whenever the, <laughs> the, the housing starts crashed, were inside the city of Portland. So that's a, it's a huge number. So yeah, I'm not painting a picture of only the urban core and I'm not ignoring the rest of the suburban. So we've got a big slice of the suburban representation there. So you can see it's not a straight line curve, but it has been going down. This is, this is modeling both um, carbon emissions from cars and trucks, but also uh, energy sources, um, uh, building energy, and so forth and so on. It's a model not unlike many around the country. We should be standardizing those more, but we're, we're beginning to get there. Um, and I have two more recent years than in, in this graph. Uh, we've actually decreased um, per capita GHG uh, emissions by 19% as of uh, the end of 2008. So that's a good story to tell, and that's the reason for kind of talking about the Portland story. Um, so my uh, inquiry generally has been what accounts for this success to date uh, and what does the city still need to do um, uh, because the 19% clearly isn't enough um, and what elements from this experience might be transferable or applicable. So really quickly here's what I'm going to present uh, to you for the rest of this session. Uh, part one only today uh, which is Portland's climate profile really quickly. Uh, the, the meat of it is really what are the factors in the GHG reductions that, we, uh, that you've seen and we'll present it in a bit more detail. And what overall findings tentatively can we draw uh, from uh, uh, examination of those factors. And I want to say I did not do independent modeling. So this is really by looking at the available data out there. If we had more money we could go through and augment modeling, try to tease out the individual effects of individual strategies and policies. That has not been um, uh, available to me uh, yet, although I will say that the Portland Metro government is engaged in that kind of effort now. Uh, part two um, will be to take these factors and sub-factors uh, and look at a couple of other cities. And I picked these two tentatively. I'm willing to take suggestions. Uh, started in on these a little bit. Um, Denver and Charlotte, because they're both also mid-sized American cities. They're not LA or Chicago or New York, but they're also growing cities like Portland. They have a moderate growth rate. Portland has about a one per, little over 1% per year population growth rate, and that's been sustained for a few decades now. Denver and Charlotte are, have been peaky, but about the same range and about the same size and frankly they appear on first blush to be at different points on the spectrum. Portland probably out ahead on the climate change stuff. Denver has shown some real initiative around uh, transit funding, uh, locally funded through a bond measure uh, and transit oriented zoning and development um, and Charlotte's kind of needs to get there. Uh, so and we've got west, rocky, middle, rocky and uh, east. Um, but you'll have to wait on that part. Uh, so uh, looking at the Portland area specifically, and these are metropolitan numbers, um, uh, not city of Portland numbers, um, 31 million metric tons a year. I have no idea what that means until I look at it across other metro areas. It's, it sounds like a big number. The more important thing is to look down inside of that and see, again, what are the sources. These are the three big clumps, uh, materials, and this is how metro groups them, which are both uh, production and distribution of goods uh, and foods. Uh, energy, which is really focused on buildings and appliances, and transportation, um, primarily uh, passenger transportation because the uh, 
the, f the long haul freight anyway is up in the materials piece. So breaking each one of those down just a bit, um, sorry if this gets a little boring, it goes actually pretty quickly here. Um, on the <coughs> materials side, the production of goods and processing of goods is about, is the majority or the half of that anyway, 25%, food 14%, long distance freight 7, solid waste 1, and infrastructure only 1. So you kind of get a sense of where maybe the bigger targets ought to be that we're, uh, that we're looking at. Um, and you might ask, well, what does any of this have to do with urban form? And when you think about it, um, the distance that the goods have to travel uh, have something to do with urban form and urban arrangement and urban transportation. Food production, the more of it that is local, and in our case we have the, the benefit of having um, temperate climate and great soils and so forth, but even in other parts of the country growing food seasonally um, can be a big part of it. The more that that's produced locally, the, 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 the less that number uh, uh, becomes. And the solid waste number as well can be knocked down by aggressive neighborhood scale um, recycling policies and composting and also um, uh, 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 commercial source reduction uh, pieces. Um, the energy part, uh, heating and lighting and cooling is about 20 percent, appliances and devices about 7 percent. These are Portland figures. So these are slightly different than those national numbers you saw, but it's important if you're going to tailor make strategies to get at what your numbers are. There's Cl clarification, hopefully, question. Well, my understanding is they, they did life cycle um, assessment for like the good sector, but they didn't do it the energy <coughs> sector. I think there's some, true. is that correct? I think that's true from what I've been able to determine, yeah. Um, on the, uh, I just, the reason for highlighting this slide in particular is that um, the building HVAC, if you kind of isolate that one for a moment, um, city policies, you can make policies about changing the light bulbs and there'll be some technological advances. But the notion about compact urban form begins to make some sense in the category of building energy efficiencies uh, for two reasons. One, the more you're uh, stacking units vertically, for example, you're, you're reducing heat loss uh, and in some ways mitigating heat gain. The other um, piece, which I think is more profound and more powerful, <coughs> is that a certain level of density and mix of uses, uh, decentralized, localized um, heating and cooling systems begin to make sense. Mm -hmm. So you're avoiding uh, all of the waste of the peaks and valleys with large scale um, uh, distribution systems, uh, <coughs> systems. And really the heating and cooling is the big part of the energy load for buildings. Um, and this area, I think, has not been accounted for in those models that you saw earlier in those projections about the 10 percent and so forth. So I, I think this is a huge territory uh, to make progress in and a number of cities, including Portland, are beginning to look at how to organize that kind of district energy system. They used to exist in many downtowns, steam heat, uh, hot water heat. Um, those are being reintroduced in Scandinavia with great success. There's no reason they really can't occur here except that uh, it's a matter of kind of bringing around the utilities and some of those governance questions I mentioned before. Uh, finally, transportation, uh, again, uh, kind of dialing in on the local as opposed to the other, which is the others, the, the long distance travel and airplanes and so forth. The local transport, um, again, half of that might be a technological advance in fuel efficiency and so forth, um, but the other half may come from simply allowing people to have options not to use a car at all. Um, you can see that transit is very efficient, <laughs> right? I mean, we're, we're already there on, on transit, most of which, at least in our region, is electrified so, or clean diesel in the case of buses. Um, so coming back uh, to this number, I wanted to look, okay, uh, what, what is this number in context or this trend in context because we are a growing city and two, um, how, what is, what is possibly accounted for this drop? Because I don't know of another metropolitan area that's experienced an actual decrease. LA has done some things and has a fair amount of density. It's actually, that's the surprise out there is Los Angeles is actually making some strides here. Um, the numbers that I'm showing you here relate again to Portland City and Multnomah County. When you look at this map, it's a little bit hard to see. There's a lighter shade uh, here. And it's really this subset 
So it's the, the inner portion uh, of the region. This is Portland's uh, urban growth boundary, uh, which is complicated because this is in the state of Washington across the river and under a different legal system and under a milder version of growth management uh, uh, law. But the, the, the numbers I showed you there, the historic trend, uh, is for this part. But about from here over, it's been, as I said, recently annexed a lot of new construction and so forth and so on. So we're not just talking about an older urban core. And the metro numbers I showed you essentially were for the Oregon side with an estimate for the Washington side. So when I showed you the metro regional numbers and then the city county numbers, that's kind of the geography. Um, but here's the other conundrum, which is we're growing. And uh, so again, this number dips down again. So it's down around um, uh, the, the uh, per capita number was down below 19%, which means when you take in the growth, here's the US trend, but when you take in our growth of 1% a year or so, and you, so you add back 17% or so to the total people, you're growing that per capita base you actually end up now in 2008 about 2% 2 below 1990 levels. Still a good story compared to the trend line at the top, but um, it puts it in context. We've got to be much, much more aggressive. We can't just build a few more transit lines and transit stations and bike paths and call it a day. Um, in fact, here's kind of a graphic representation of that. Here's uh, about where we are there. That was our... Um, uh, 2010 goal back in the 1993 action plan, 10% below. I said we're really about 2% below because of all the growth. Um, and here's where we got to get uh, way down there. So um, again, I'm going to isolate what we do know has happened and try to understand what that is. And after um, looking at this many different ways, things began to fall into about four groups of factors for me. Um, one are simply environmental factors, not meaning the natural environment, but things um, that might differentiate the Portland region from other places for, for whatever set of reasons uh, as a kind of um, ambient factor. The more direct or proximate factors, these relate to specific actions that have been taken. Uh, and uh, the next two set are a little more um, ephemeral, but I think are actually critical to making the transferability argument, which are really looking at the larger policy context um, that has occurred, which may or may not be transferable, and below that even um, a more fundamental level of cultural, um, essentially uh, cultural values translated into a uh, framework, including questions about governance. And I'm hoping that some of those might be transferable. So looking uh, at uh, these environmental factors, I looked at all of these. There could be other explanations uh, other than the strategies you're about to see in a few minutes for Portland's success. But I looked at these, and there's nothing that stands out here from any other region in the United States. That is to say, you know, our, and particularly that would explain a downward trend. In other words, uh, we haven't had any more dramatic climate swings in any other part uh, of the country. Our growth rate is greater than some East Coast cities, but very comparable to many of the, the other cities that uh, I've mentioned and, and others at about 1%. So we're, we're not growing as fast as Phoenix or Las Vegas were. Uh, we're in the kind of the middle of the pack. Um, we've had the same economic cycles uh, and employment that most other major metropolitan areas have had. We tend to enter the cycle a little bit later and come out of it a little bit later. Um, although we may be beating California on this latest round, I don't know uh, about that. But there's nothing that says, well, of course, because people weren't driving to work. They didn't have a job. Well, th it's not any different in Portland, really, significantly enough that, than anywhere else. Our utility mix, uh, like everyone, every region's is different, but it's not dramatically different than Seattle's, for example, uh, or even San Francisco's. Uh, ours, Seattle's is actually a little better because part of the Portland region utility mix actually comes from one, um, mostly from hydropower uh, and increasingly a little bit from wind power, but also from a coal plant in eastern Oregon. Um, and some of the purchase on the broad network begins to even things out anyway from region to region. Um, demographics, people often say, well, of course Portland, because they're all white and well-educated and young. Um, well, maybe in some inner neighborhoods in Portland, uh, 
but actually the demographics aren't all that different. And particularly when you look at the changes, the change trends in the demographics that are in that same time frame I uh, mentioned to you, um, it's getting less white, it's getting uh, much more diverse in terms of uh, incomes and educations and so forth. So um, the sort of picture book image of um, the, the 25 year old Portlander on a bike um, with cell phone in one hand and cappuccino in the other, um, it, you know, <laughs> yeah, you will see that, but it's, uh, it doesn't explain uh, those trends. Uh, and in fact, one way to cross-examine that is look at car ownership. You know, is everyone riding a bike or not working, just sitting in a cafe? Um, uh, the car ownership is one in interesting indication that's really no different than most uh, other large okay. cities. People do drive less. They still own cars, uh, but they drive less. And the driving less is part of the urban form mix that I want to talk about. So. If any of you can think of other environmental factors that should be examined that might possibly explain that drop, I would be, I'd love to investigate those. Um, I'm going to go to the more proximate factors for that, um, that dip and look at these things. And these, many of them fall squarely into the sort of urban planning uh, and land policy arena. Uh, one is the Portland urban growth boundary, well known. <coughs> Uh, another is fairly aggressive investment in transportation options. Uh, and there are really two categories of that. Here are the big ones at, that have been sustained for um, a couple of decades or more now have been investment in light rail and intensification of bus transit, uh, mostly on uh, corridors and serving uh, populations where the population is densest. Um, that has had with it a concomitant uh, investment in policy and in real dollars in compact urban <coughs> form uh, and mixed use development, walkable neighborhoods. That has also been accompanied by uh, pretty strict parking limitations, both starting in the central city and then later in some of the commercial uh, neighborhood commercial areas. Again, it hasn't affected car ownership, but it has given people other options about how to get around. Um, I, I, without going through all the numbers, I would say that that first chunk is the big story here, and we can, we can come back to that. Uh, we've also, for though, for many years, um, done pretty aggressive recycling and waste reduction. Uh, and more recently have introduced some other transit <laughs> options like bringing back the old streetcar system that was there until the early 50s, um, as was the case in most American cities, uh, and making bicycle improvements. Um, biking is kind of poo-pooed by a lot of people who think it's not that serious. I guess I would say that um, as recently as seven or maybe now eight years ago, Portland's um, citywide commute by bike to work rate was less than 1%, which is characteristic of all U.S. cities. It's now 6% in a very short period of time. That's a big number. So that gets the attention of even the Europeans, who <laughs> many of those cities are up at the 30 plus percentile uh, rate. And in fact, Portland in its uh, current planning effort um, which I kicked off before leaving there, is setting a target of 25% in the next 20 years. Um, part of Portland is very hilly and very steep, but a lot of it is very flat. And, um, and so there's pretty ambitious investment strategy in bikes. And if you've been to Amsterdam and Copenhagen, you know what I'm talking about. It's not rocket science to do this. It's a, it's a, it's a cultural shift, a mentality shift. Um, and, you know, people there wear their work clothes and no helmets and no lycra as they, as they bike to work, so can't be done. But this would, these last two would not explain that, that precipitous curve. They came much later. And because we don't really have the sophisticated modeling uh, yet to tease these apart very well, what I've done is looked at how things have been implemented over time. And the first four have been implemented aggressively and steadily for 20 plus years. Uh, and the, the latter have come along uh, a bit later. And then there's a, um, a group here that are perhaps somewhat significant, but probably not significant in explaining the history here. They may be more significant going forward. And those are energy efficient buildings. I think we have less than 100 or 150 lead buildings, commercial buildings. Um, those are growing in number and the city has standards like many other places. Um, the city has been much more aggressive about its own public purchase of power from private utility companies demanding that, um, that uh, a big share of that be um, a green energy, uh, which because we're such a large purchaser then has effect on, on that market. Um, 
There have been efforts in developing green infrastructure and in tree canopy. Um, mostly the, those have been done for uh, ecological um, restoration reasons, um, bringing back urban habitat for endangered species and so forth and so on. But they have the added benefit of sequestering carbon in the case of tree, uh, tree canopy and of lowering that infrastructure energy bill that you saw was really around one or one and a half percent um, by using um, passive technology for things like <coughs> uh, storm water rather than uh, high energy uh, waste treatment plants. Um, so they have had that benefit. And then low food production is a very popular uh, one. We're, we're not, I don't think, ready to say that it has, any, has had any demonstrable effect yet, but it could over time uh, account for some portion. So this is sort of the range of those more direct interventions uh, that I have uh, examined and have numbers for some, not for all. Um, that's continuing work, but I think it's fair to say that that first grouping accounts for that storyline. And I want to just acquaint you with a couple, a, a little bit of imagery about that so you kind of get what I'm talking about. Um, you saw the, 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 the geographic map of a few minutes ago. This is this yellow outline here on this side of the Columbia River uh, is the legal urban growth boundary. So that cannot be moved except by a vote of the adopted, of the, me, of the elected Metropolitan Council, which has planning authority. So moving this line uh, has been very controversial, but not very easy over the last 30 years. And it has essentially uh, contained growth. This was the, some of that scenario building that was done when that map was created in 95, saying this is sort of business as usual. This is what happens. Here was the sort of development pattern at the time. And that's pretty much what it looked like. And through a large uh, planning process that engaged a lot of citizens throughout the region, uh, there are 28 jurisdictions within this uh, boundary. Um, they said we'd rather have a sort of polycentric but relatively compact and transit served urban form. And this has been the guide now not only for land use planning but for transportation investments uh, at the metropolitan scale. And the metro agency, unlike um, MAPC here, actually has enforcement teeth. It has to, to make sure that our plans in the cities and its own plan conforms with the state planning law. And um, it has the added benefit of two other things, uh, being able to um, exercise tax and bond authority. It's been very mild on the tax because it's still a political experiment, but has successfully raised um, two large rounds of open space acquisition bonds to sort of help with the urban form on the inside, bringing nature back into the city. Perhaps more importantly, being the regional clearinghouse for federal transportation dollars. So guiding it toward this map rather than simply toward more highway expansion projects, I think has been the other uh, big key here. Um, the uh, investment has panned out very well in terms of building out the light rail system. This is a diagram from a long time ago when they were first conceiving of the light rail system. We did not start with a 100-year-old Green Line or with Manhattan's uh, system of subway. This was really has been built out since 1987, so really just, you know, 20 plus years. Um, and uh, the bold lines were the first to be built, um, the, the blue one, and then connecting to the airport, um, which I think is a big one, the, the train station is down in here. Uh, and then connecting out to these other suburban communities. These have um, uh, all been built now with the exception of this one, and there's actually a new connector line that's been built and opened here. Uh, it just keeps being built out, and that machinery has never stopped. It continues. The next line is engineered, planned, engineered, funded, as the, as the one before it is finishing. Um, been fairly clever and strategic about getting federal matching dollars, which is increasingly difficult to do, but we hope will be, become easier under the current administration. Um, here's a, uh, an image just showing downtown Portland where there's a crisscross of of a light rail line that's just been extended up the old bus mall and the crisscross with the more urban city-centered streetcar uh, line, uh, which is a picture here. This opened in, this is the first test train. This is in 2001, I think. Uh, and so, you know, there was a 50-year gap <laughs> in streetcar service, but it's extremely popular. Both the light rail and the streetcar have far surpassed ridership um, 
uh, projections, um, which is great because it keeps the confidence of the federal funders up. Uh, Community is excited about it, and um, the uh, TriMet, which is the regional transit operator, now has about 100 million trips a year on its system. That's including the buses and the... So uh, people like taking transit. Um, my wife and I live uh, fairly centrally located, and we use our car maybe once or twice a week. Mostly it's <coughs> walking, biking, or taking the streetcar. Uh, geographically, uh, city uh, the city proper is about 600. We'll see when the census comes out, but about 600,000. The metro is about 2.2, 2.3 million. Uh, m most of this is the 2.2 million um, because none of the numbers I've shown you are for city proper. They're city plus. Not all the numbers I've showed you are for the whole metro region. And that's part of the difficulty uh, in piecing this together is to try to <laughs> cobble together different data sets and make them, uh, make them match. But you really have to look at the whole metro to make any sense of climate change. You can't do it by cherry picking a few urban neighborhoods. Um, uh, I mentioned the bike uh, ridership number. Um, this is sort of mid-afternoon, but on this particular bridge crossing downtown into a set of close-in neighborhoods, there's a virtual traffic jam of bicycles on this, uh, on this bridge. So it's become now a funding priority to widen the bridge uh, crossings for bicycles. We're actually building a new bridge just south of this one for light rail, streetcar, and bikes only. No cars, uh, no trucks. Um, the other part of that, besides the transportation investment, which is absolutely critical, is looking at ways to infill neighborhoods in ways that are acceptable to neighborhoods and at a variety of scales. So on the left, you see an image um, not unlike some New England situations where you have a traditional um, home. This could be in my neighborhood in Cambridge. Uh, here's one put on a small corner lot next to it that's actually a duplex. So you're getting you know, uh, infill over a large landscape. This can actually add up to a lot and improve. Uh, walkability and prospects for more local commercial services to serve you within an easy walk. On the other end of the scale are these kind of mid-rise apartment buildings that you're beginning to see going up. Contrary to most, this is in the so-called Pearl District, contrary to most, um, and we used to live in that building. Um, many of these units are not um, out of reach. For uh, There are about a third of the units in that district that have been built are affordable units, so trying to do that. The other piece is at this scale, having transit-oriented development and family-oriented uh, development on the inside. This is really critical. This is not unusual for many cities, uh, Boston and other places around the country. I think it's the percentage of this that's being done in Portland as opposed to the percentage of the continuing low-rise, uh, more suburban, which is happening, but I think the, percent, the numbers are, are uh, the key story there in terms of the percentages taking uh, urban uh, areas that need redevelopment and prioritizing those through redevelopment agency uh, actions primarily. This was the old rail yards uh, north of downtown. We did a plan for redeveloping those and this is kind of the new urban neighborhood that you have there. This all occurred within about a 10 year period. They're now um, about 15,000 residents in that neighborhood. So it's, it's um, very urban, transit served. Um, Multi-use, here's another example south of downtown called the South Waterfront, where we took uh, another industrial piece where all the industry in both these cases had left. I should say that a concomitant policy to developing these two more urban and centrally located districts was to preserve about 92% of all the industrial land in Portland for industry, for continued use by industry, and for reuse by industry, because we feel that's a critical part of the base, and to actually be sustainable, <laughs> you need to keep those jobs where the people are. And um, we've been sort of counter-cyclical in that trend too, that we've actually gained manufacturing sector jobs overall, not, not by individual subsector, but overall in Portland as opposed to losing more of them overseas. So this is the South Waterfront District uh, here. Uh, this was an opportunity because it's potentially connected to a research medical university on the Hill. Um, this is uh, Post, post plan is beginning to be built out. There are now about twice as many buildings there, but you can see um, <coughs> it's now actually connected by an aerial tramway between the two, so you don't have to drive at all. Uh, and this is very mixed use. About half of the square footage is residential, about half of it is uh, institutional office or lab, and a very small percentage is um, 
for uh, retail. We didn't want, we want people driving here as a destination. It's mostly working and living in an urban format. This was a bold experiment for Portlanders because um, it was outside the traditional downtown uh, boundary, but hooking it to the streetcar, connecting it to the university system and defining it as a sort of science and technology play uh, allowed people who weren't on board with density as an answer to sustainability to sort of come around a bit, at least a majority uh, of people. There's a kind of early drawing of what it might look like at build out. Uh, and the other focus uh, that we've had, at least in the city of Portland, and it's probably most important there uh, over the suburbs, is uh, kind of reconquering the city proper for, for families. Because um, there still is this notion that somehow life is better, safer, um, there's more active recreation on the outskirts where there's single family homes and big yards than there is in the center. We're actually seeing another generation of parents coming along now in these more urban districts, districts like this, which are old courtyard housing projects, and even those denser districts I showed you a moment ago, where families want to stay. And we now have in uh, this neighborhood here um, a new school being built on the ground floor, actually by a prior Loeb fellow, a grade school, public grade school being built on the ground floor of a new housing project. So it's an indicator that uh, there's a trend going, a, a counter trend happening here, which I think is really, really key to that soft <laughs> software of cities, I think is really important to this equation. Um, it's not simply a matter of hard urban design, but how do people want to, to live. Um, so uh, I mentioned the things that are kind of of, the, of of lesser effect so far, but probably will have some profound effect. I want to highlight just this one, which is um, our biggest submittal for the stimulus, the first round of stimulus money was actually for building retrofits and for homeowners. Um, it's great to build new energy efficient buildings. That's a tiny percentage of the building stock. What's actually the biggest bang for the buck is retrofitting existing homes. Um, and that's where you really get that building energy number to start uh, making some sense to you. Um, I mentioned the renewable purchase um, uh, goals uh, here. Um, this is a very aggressive goal, 100% renewable energy by uh, 2015. We'll see if we make that. Now that was for city government purchase. That is not to say all ratepayers in the, in the city. But as a leadership uh, move, I think that's uh, really important. The state has really made this other, this image possible over here, which is giving um, tax credits, uh, very favorable uh, financing for both uh, wind and solar uh, production. Uh, renewable fuels, um, I won't go through uh, all of this, but um, again, the, the recycling uh, is not just the residential, but on the commercial side. The other piece that people forget about buildings, I know Chris knows this, is that there's a lot of embedded energy in existing buildings. And the idea of reusing and recycling buildings, not just um, the notion of building new ones with better systems in them, um, that's energy that should get uh, counted into the equation. And where you can't, you recycle. Uh, lots of green stuff going on, as I mentioned, to knock down the uh, infrastructure bill, um, both in terms of maintenance, which is, again, probably not accounted for very well in some of those numbers we saw. They tend to look at the big capital investment numbers. Uh, but also in terms of the energy to operate uh, uh, the uh, uh, sewage plants at a higher capacity because there's a lot of storm water going in them, the tree canopy, uh, which I, I mentioned, and uh, watershed restoration. So let me move to the next, the third set of factors that, because um, I want to leave enough time for questions here. Um, and these are really hard to quantify. They're, in fact, almost impossible, but I think you cannot talk about Portland without understanding uh, these five contextual pieces of policy that um, in some ways go back to the Oregon land use law in 1973, which was a pretty visionary law, really beaten over the legislator's heads by the uh, then Republican, moderate Republican governor, Tom McCall, who said we're not gonna allow Oregon to be Californicated, essentially. And by that he meant we need to preserve the rural landscape uh, for productivity and to make the cities compact and he got a majority of the legislators in the early 70s to go along with that idea. Uh, worked with a group of activists uh, that became a thousand friends of Oregon, one of the seminal uh, conservation groups in the country, to um, 
beat up on the legislators from the side, formed a nice coalition of, of a then rural uh, and uh, urban and environmental interests to get this landmark law passed. But this means that every city has had to deal with this notion of having a deliberate plan for its future at a whole city scale that includes a boundary and some compact form. So that's inculcated into the system, has been there now for um, getting close to 40 years. So you can't just say, go do all these things or expect all these things, other things that I mentioned that will happen easily without this uh, piece of background. And so these are discounting that a little bit. Um, the fact that we have an elected uh, subsequent to that, it became more efficient for close together cities in the petro metropolitan region of Portland to say, why are we all doing this individual planning just to meet these state goals? Wouldn't it be better to do it together? And actually uh, elected uh, a uh, metropolitan council with land use uh, authority. That's also unusual in the United States. Uh, in fact, I think it's unique in the United States uh, with the power they have and the fact that they're elected. Um, they developed that 2040 plan I showed you a bit earlier, um, which is everybody in the region kind of knows what that is, so there's, a, there's an understanding about it. Um, there were planning efforts started in the city core in, in actually before the statewide planning goals took effect that started people thinking about urban revitalization and the power of that. So that's not unlike Boston and other East Coast cities. It took hold in Portland and proved results pretty early and people were excited about it. Um, there was an early response to the Kyoto uh, protocols and said, why don't we have an action plan? So I think we were the first city to actually declare a climate action strategy officially adopted in 1993 set some of those early goals that we haven't met yet, but at least got into the policy arena. And finally, uh, the fact that there have been increasingly harder to get, at least until now, federal funds for alternative transportation. Um, when uh, the first light rail line was put in, it came about because we, the voters there, defeated a freeway extension and were able in the <coughs> Jimmy Carter days to just take that federal money for the freeway and poured it over into building the first light rail system. That kind of started um, a whole path of, of activity. And in fact, um, I, I would say it's been one of the most important things because it institutionalized building transit as a mainstream activity. So regardless of policy debates that go on, there are these transportation engineers. That's my job is to build light rail. And so that's very powerful once you set up that. Uh, apparatus, as you probably know with, from experience dealing with highway departments. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, it's been harder to do, as I say. Then these are the last, or the, maybe the deepest set of factors. And these get a little squishier, uh, admittedly. But again, I think they're part of the puzzle. And if you don't address these somehow, you can't just say, well, Charlotte can just do this. Um, you need to look for what are the native versions of these in different uh, uh, regions and localities. In our case, I think these five are kind of the grassroots of all of this. Uh, a very strong sense of place and geography. That's probably been there since pioneer days. Um, it, it's why a lot of people continue to move to Portland. Um, uh, there has certainly been this culture of planning as I've described and I have often referred to this as deliberate intentionality of deciding in our case in the late 60s, early 70s, what we wanted to be as we, as, as when we grew up and aligning all the resources to do that. And that level of intentional investment and sticking to the overall vision has actually survived all the intervening changeovers in mayors and metro councils and so forth. So that culture is, I think, important. And it, you don't have to have it in still presto. You kind of have to grow it, nurture it, and, and so forth and so on. And I, I was heartened by hearing about Denver's sort of move into the big move into uh, transit-oriented development by essentially saying we're not going to wait for the feds, we will tax ourselves to build a transit system and to put. So uh, again, I think these things can be translated into different environments. Um, this notion of that I mentioned about the transit agencies is a good example where the vision just stays a vision, but you actually grind it into the bureaucratic uh, processes and in some extent the corporate processes right off the bat and continue to build momentum that way. I don't think any of this would have been possible in Portland without cross-sector. Um, you don't just leave it to government to do, that this is something that everybody has to sort of pull the oar on. And um, finally, I think the, the real bedrock here is the public awareness and advocacy and engagement. 
uh, around this. And that is also something, when, once you get over initial skepticism, you can begin to build uh, in any of our places. And I actually think the climate change long emergency is a great place to start that conversation in, in places that know they need to do something, but they don't quite know what to do. There may be federal money coming. It's a, way, it's a nice kind of galvanizing uh, point. Um, and just to sort of put a little science, if you will, on that last one, this is a colleague uh, of ours, Tim Campbell, uh, part of the Urban Age Institute, who's been for the last years kind of going around the world and studying the informal networks. He calls them knowledge networks amongst uh, leaders, both formal and informal leaders in cities, business, government, community, institutional leaders, and drawing these kind of scattergrams, these maps, and these represent uh, in some cases, individual or multiple conversations with uh, those people in those communities, and just showing who knows who, who's connected to whom regularly. And he's defined different patterns, in, interesting for different cities. And so actually, here's one of our comparable cities. Uh, Charlotte here is uh, Portland up here. Uh, this is Barcelona. Uh, and here, here's Turin, almost a perfect you know, dandelion form. Somehow it's highly structured, been there for a long time, people know who they talk to, and, and there is some crossover. The Portland one he found unique, and I said, what is that about? I mean, we're the city that likes to meet and all this kind of stuff. How come there aren't more of these, th how come isn't a tight little ball? He said, well, Portland's is actually more diffuse because for, it has two benefits. One is these actually represent uh, interests and Rather than see them as isolated, think of these as deeper, that they actually, not every one of these is some official leader. A lot of these are advocates, are uh, ordinary people who just happen to get, uh, and they have sort of by nature less immediate access to everybody. So there tend to be one or two or three people that then connect in. And so in some ways, uh, this is a very rich diagram because uh, it <coughs> cuts across many topical interests. Um, and, and there are connections, some, I don't know, I was interviewed on one of those points on that diagram, or was I, I don't know who all of them are, um, but they came from different, uh, walk, completely different walks of life and different strata in organizations and in neighborhoods. Um, this one looks really interesting to me. I don't know what that means. I'll have to talk to Tim more. This is, his, this just, he just sent me this yesterday. This just came out. So Wendell's probably got a copy on his computer waiting as well. Um, but there's something about this governance notion that we have to find ways to get the, whatever networks exist in these places to see this challenge and see that part of meeting the challenge isn't just saying the feds will do it for me in time, city hall will do it for me in time, corporations are bad if they just get their act together it would be solved. It, it's got to be this kind of network situation that gets uh, employed. So. Um, Overall findings for this first phase are really that um, um, Portland's uh, success, I've said this already, has really come from this land use transportation nexus, that's, that's sort of what's now called smart growth. Um, that that smart growth legacy provides leverage, um, not only for intensifying those efforts, um, uh, but concomitant efforts as well, that really focusing on trip reduction and on energy efficiency. Um, but future gains will also need to come from uh, building energy, as I mentioned before, um, including existing building stock. The transferability of Portland strategy will depend on understanding these foundational pieces as well as the, the deliberate strategies. I, th I really think that is true. Um, I, mean, I go talk lots of places, Armando knows, and they say, yeah, but that's just Portland. I mean, there's something in the water there. Well, what is it that's in the water and what's translatable? What could be adapted? And finally, uh, I think some level of more sophisticated modeling is necessary that begins to tease apart strategies, not just simply look at sectors, but to actually look at interventions and how they've succeeded and, and how they have it. And there's only so far you can go down that road before it just becomes brain damage and you're not really sure if you're getting you know, more value out of it. But there's a, a ways down that road that we ought to, uh, ought to go. Uh, and then finally, just a preview of what uh, is, is the second piece of this, which is to again look at these three cities uh, and to evaluate those same factors and if there appear others in those other places to add those to the, um, uh, the matrix. But to do that in a fairly systematic way and to understand uh, 
uh, both qualitatively and quantitatively, what have they done, what are they on a trajectory to do, and to try to plot those trajectories, um, uh, and then to make some additional conclusions after looking at some comparable cities. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks, Gail, and we do have time for some questions, and I think, uh, let me start sure. with Juan and, and just kind of doing a little the hard mental one. math and trying to think back. So yeah. to, to have a sense of where Portland fits into the sort of the U.S. picture here mm -hmm. as a metropolitan region, uh, did I see something like 13 million tons of greenhouse gases a year? I think it was. Region and when I think it might have 31, actually. 31, yeah. okay. And so that would be over... 2.2 million people, that would be that the right number. population uh, right. denominator. So that's, uh, that's like 14 tons something per person, like something like that. So the U.S. is up over 20, depending on right. where you look. Right. So it's, you know, it's like a, a third less or something like that. Yeah. It would be interesting to, to look at. So that's good performance, and mm -hmm. as we know, it's mm -hmm. one of the few places in the United States mm -hmm. has actually reduced its per capita greenhouse gas emissions. And given that this is a country with a growing population, that's a darn good thing that yeah. <laughs> we're seeing it's possible yeah. to do that. We need to do that. Uh, but how do you think uh, sort of Denver and uh, Charlotte will stack up along that line? Because that does seem like a way as you get into phase two Absolutely. to sort of think about a target as well as a sort of a relative performance factor for, for U.S. cities. Yeah. Well, I think there's a, a snapshot that has to be taken now, and I think those cities won't show that same number. They'll have a higher number. They're more spread out and have less of that infrastructure that I mentioned. I think the utility would be to say, if you did include more of that infrastructure, more of that green transportation and urban development infrastructure, given your geography, given your, given your existing pattern, what could a refill strategy yield in your case? And who might that, who might that benefit? Um, I think th that's two interesting pieces. The third piece to me is really you look at enough of these U.S. cities and then you suddenly kind of have a federal agenda, right? For what, what's, what's your match, federal government? How are you going to help with this? Right now, the federal conversation is very uh, uh, well-meaning in some, in some quarters, but very, uh, yeah, very kind of obtuse almost. I mean, there's a lot of platitudes, but, but how it actually benefits this kind of infrastructure play is not yet clear. And so... I'm hopeful that by looking at a few of these cities, we might define a few more specific stratagems that would um, count for more than other things in federal allocations, okay, so given the political process. Yes. Uh, Somewhat interested in the, the open space strategy. Yeah. You mentioned that. Well, I'm interested in how. Is this a, you're using bonds, but are you using other land trust mechanisms? And where yeah. is the, it's good, good is question. there an acquisition of? Land there's within a, the, there's a the growth boundary or yeah. within well, neighborhoods, how does it actually well, Let me just say what the land? importance of it is other than the obvious one, which is that as part of this larger political experiment around regional growth containment, you've got to have green inside or people lose. They just don't want to be there any longer. I mean, it's just part of the bargain. How you get there in our case has been, first of all, largely through uh, regulation, uh, environmental zones. Um, which have avoided property takings, although they've been controversial, because they've been partial property, clustering development, and so forth, focusing primarily on streams and wetlands, and to some degree, ridge tops, and that's been expanded a little bit over time. That's been augmented by land trusts and others coming in and acquiring uh, pieces, um, sometimes to hold, sometimes uh, to transfer. Uh, the most recent piece have been these two bond measures, where uh, basically, uh, Metro government, before floating either of those bonds, one about seven years ago and one just a year ago or so, went out and polled the metropolitan population and said, do you generally support this growth management thing and would you support a substantial uh, bond effort? You're, you're going to have to pay for it. And the polling was very high. <coughs> it was highest not for local active recreation park space, but for natural resource preservation inside the urban growth boundary. So they kind of said yes to both. That was a really lucky thing, and they did it twice. So um, like Denver approving its light rail bond, this was another. You, you, don't, you shouldn't just 
um, assume the worst. <laughs> you got to go ask people, and uh, sometimes they'll surprise you. Okay. Yes. Yeah. There's no doubt that the the growth, the urban growth boundary, is uh, a major factor in yeah. the the development of Portland. <clears throat> What do you think the chances for transferability of this sort of development method would be on a city that's already far outpaced any sort of idea of an urban growth yeah. boundary? Places like LA or Atlanta. Right. Very, very difficult. Um, I, I actually toyed briefly with the idea of using Atlanta as one of the comparison cities, and I thought it's just such a different animal that I, I need to start with some group of cities that have a little bit more of a or more of a cohort. Um, Boston and even New York Metro are very spread out once you get outside the historic uh, cores. So, and I don't think given the long-standing, Jim Stockard and I were just having this conversation the other day, um, given the long-standing jurisdictional territoriality and disputes, um, I don't see in an, any time in the near uh, or medium term that the state of Massachusetts is going to pass a, an Oregon-style land use planning bill that, that talks about regionalism or metropolitanism with the force of law. So I think, as opposed to a policy and regulatory strategy, uh, regions and metropolitan areas like this one need to, th need to follow the money, need to think about how do you incent it money-wise. Yeah, um, I think one of the, the solutions that's possible is instead of looking at it as a macro urban area, is to divide it into little nucleuses of urban yeah. development areas around yeah. the existing development course. I think that's re that's really true, and that could not only be a place for some additional transportation notions, but <laughs> what we have found in the Portland metropolitan region is that a lot of this good feeling stuff started in the urban core, and it took a, a long time two or more decades for it to begin to catch in the suburbs. And it's really only been the last seven or eight years that it's begun to catch. Suddenly these suburban towns want to there there. And the, the idea of maybe getting increased transit service and maybe getting <coughs> more commercial services they can walk to, more uh, housing stock variety so the elderly don't have to leave that community and live somewhere else, that's beginning to catch on. I and mean, we took, I was telling this the other day, we, we took busloads of local mayors and council people up to Vancouver, BC, which um, in its center is very much like Portland, but in the suburbs is kind of one step ahead in terms of some of the density and height you see in some of the suburban or satellite communities there. And they came back uh, just with stars in their eyes, like, well, yeah, we should have some of this. As long as we can guarantee good design, we'll go for it. So you're now seeing a series of suburban jurisdictions actually institutionalizing for the first time tax increment authority um, in their downtown so that they can get more of this stuff going. That's a very new phenomenon. Some of them had actually outlawed it in their local charters and had to repeal that, uh, that set of things to get that going again. So it, it takes time, but it does start with that vision and with some level of experience, like, okay, we can maybe do this. What? Yes, right here. Um, the uh, figures you showed are both extremely impressive down per capita, mm -hmm. roughly 16%, and somewhat depressing yeah. when you consider the- How much further? <laughs> the, the, no, the, 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 the growth, so yeah. the absolute decrease, I guess, would be Small. someplace around 2%. Yeah. And the, our 19, our 2050 goals are 80% absolute, absolute, not per capita. Right. So given that you seem to have done everything right, or approximately everything yeah. right, what could you have done? Could you envision something that would have actually gotten you further down that curve towards the Kyoto goal? Well, there are two, two parts of the response to that. One is um, I think you'll see an improvement on that trend if we keep doing the things we've been doing. And that's because it's not a steady state. A lot of those light rail lines came on over time. They didn't all instantly appear as that growth appeared. A lot of the, the bicycle stuff, a lot of the energy stuff, a lot of the, that all was phased in over time. And so what happens is you hit a tipping point and suddenly those investments become very useful to every incremental family that moves in. And you start, in fact, we actually didn't show it here today, but we mapped um, new housing starts in the city of Portland. And 10 years ago, it was a very broadcast pattern. In the last five years, it started to snap to those corridors and centers, which are most transit served. 
Um, and, and so that's a big change. So the new increment doesn't necessarily look like a historic increment. And so that, I think that will occur. The other side, as I was saying, is we've got to have another suite of, of actions here f front on on the energy side, I think, that um, in order to get there. Yes, back here. You said at the beginning of your remarks that local government structures are not equipped to deal with climate change. How do they need to be equipped? What, what, yeah. what do you see? As There's a the million dollar question. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'm making a provocative statement there because I want to be provocative, yeah. but I think it's really true that this is such an enormous challenge. And so much of it inevitably falls to the local scale to implement it. There, there is no prescription that can be handed out at the federal level that will suit every place. And certainly <laughs> overcoming local development politics is not going to be um, uh, appetizing for congressional leaders, right? I mean, it's just, so you, these have to be customized <laughs> local solutions. On the other hand, there are two problems with that. One is it's beyond the powers of any given city hall to do it. Just, there's a suite of tools in city hall, but it's not enough. It's got to be cross-sector because uh, everybody's got responsibility for this. And two, it's cross-jurisdictional. And that's why we have a little advantage in having that metropolitan government that can do some of it. But that's what I mean. I think that that structure is not in place in most cities. And so how do you compensate for that? How do you either build it or compensate for it is, is the big, big question. Okay, time for a couple more right up here, and then we'll take one back. Recent trends have shown that the percentage of Americans who think climate change is a problem is decreasing. Mm -hmm. And those who think it's a problem but think humans cause it is decreasing. Do yeah. you have general public support in Portland? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, yes and no, probably more no, because the reason we did this in the first place, and I meant to stress that in the beginning, it wasn't, didn't have nothing to do with climate change. There was the 1993 action plan, which put a layer on it. The reason most of this occurred in Portland had to do with the perception of livability, which meant both protecting the rural and uh, making the urban more vital. And it was really all about livability. That later turned, uh, translated into sustainability. And the sharp edge of sustainability is really climate change responsiveness. So that's really been a more recent reason for this. And I think, as I was trying to allude to in the beginning, is there, there are lots of good reasons for responding to climate change that are, that are um, reasons other than climate change responsiveness. I think it's a, it's a way of building good cities and build, building good communities, healthier, more viable, uh, vital, and in the end, I think more economically sustainable and prosperous. I, I really do. Um, but if you just beat people over the head saying climate change, climate change, they're going to go back to, they're the frog in the pot of slowly boiling water and bef you know, before you know what's going on, you're cooked. That's the mentality. I mean, it's really hard to get our human brains to sustain an urgency around a 50-year, very abstract notion of of danger. It just, it really is. So the appeal in Portland has been to live, how is it changing my life? And oh, it does something for climate change. Now I can feel really good, honestly. Excellent point. Uh, I thank the sir, behind you. And I think then we can have some informal chats. Uh, well, thanks for the talk. It's very, again, uh, wanting to understand better how Portland has been able to achieve the success it has. I work for Cambridge and we're on a similar track. So we struggle with the, the um, you know, what's the, the role of Cambridge as an urban mm -hmm. core community and what are indicators of progress. Um, and so I was wondering if you had any perspective on um, the interaction between the urban core and Portland within the county. Um, because it seems like, the, I think it makes sense to look at it on a metropolitan basis. Um, mm -hmm. but some of the dynamics seems like it should be forcing the inner core to um, um, increase its emissions in the sense that you'd be having more people well, move in, yeah. you know, the population yeah. and so forth. So trying to understand that dynamic. Yeah. yeah, I think that's absolutely critical in terms of how it would play to the benefit of climate change responsiveness. Again, I would say that um, at its core, the appeal there for people is less abstract. It's more about urban vitality, more about options for living, more about the cachet of being uh, in the center and actually not having to use your car very often. 
And the fact that it has real climate change, there's a calculus attached to that for climate change, is, is the benefit. And in our case, it did start with the urban core. There's no question in terms of the momentum. Um, at some point, we jumped to, the, to the, the big picture, the metropolitan scale, and now we've been working back in <laughs> through that political and legal device on those lower scale communities. Um, if you don't have that device, it, it's, it's harder, but I would say urban or, or semi-urban communities ought to take the lead, and that's why this local initiative thing is so critical. Okay, well, let's thank you. So, thank you.